Hi everyone, I'm Bruno Aziza and welcome to another episode of Data Journeys. This is where we come to learn from data leaders, their do's, their don'ts, their best practices, and their exceptional results as they're migrating to the cloud. Today, I'm really excited to have Juan, who is the Chief Data Officer at Rackspace. We've done a lot of work together and he's got a great story to share with us. Juan, thank you so much for your time today. Welcome to the show. Let's get started. Tell us about yourself and the company and your journey. First of all, Bruno, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited about this. I mean, I, this is one of the topics that I absolutely geek out about. I'm fairly passionate about. So my name is Juan Riojas. I'm the Chief Data Officer for Rackspace. My responsibility is looking at uh, data analytics internally for the company and really, truly taking and elevating data as a strategic asset. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Rackspace, but if you're not, we are a global multi-cloud solutions provider. We have over 140,000 customers. We are in multiple geographies, and we are we ultimately help enable transformations all around data services, multi-cloud, private cloud, um, security. And so now you've been at Rackspace for a couple of years. Now, previously to this, you were at Informatica. You yes. also worked at Accenture. So you have a really diverse perspective on this world of data analytics. You've been in the space for a long time. So tell us a little bit, when you started at Rackspace, what were the use cases? What were the problems you were brought in to kind of solve or optimize for? My background is what I think helps kind of look at data holistically. You saw my first half of my career, I called it Accenture, but my first half of my career was all in supply chain. In supply chain, you always have to look at how all the dots connect because everything has an effect. For every action, there's a reaction. So when I, I had a little bit of the consulting, I went into the consulting world. It helps at least helps you look at, uh, at problem solving. It helps you look and really refine how you look at, at opportunities. In Rackspace, and I fast forward now into what we're doing at Rackspace, and I can certainly see how we want to go and take our data seriously. And when we started investing into that, I think one of the biggest tenants that we saw was really looking at how to start driving better customer experience through NPS, that's be the result. And then secondly, in this quantum world where everything's connected and it's a subscription-based economy, it's how do we mitigate our churn? If you can do those things and you can get it right, that's really what sets you apart. And they created the role for you. There was no chief data officer at Rackspace mm -hmm. before. So can we talk more about this one, the customer experience and churn, how is that measured and how do you construct a, an effective data infrastructure around these two business objectives? This data office did not exist. What you had is multiple organizations that were decentralized and we brought them, we brought them all together. And what we had, what we had in churn was, for example, there was 14 different versions of how we measure churn on NPS. There's multiple different versions of how we look at NPS. And on those two things, how data and the infrastructure helped us, helped us get to uh, a significant improvement was by bringing the data together. At Rackspace, when I first came in, we had 70 ODSs, uh, four data warehouses, a data lake. It really wasn't being managed or governed to the best of its ability. And by bringing all the data together, we were effectively being able to go ahead and one, harmonize the data, get it near real time. We were able to go and standardize on definition. So we had integrity around our metadata. And then third is we exposed it. We exposed it in a way that was easy to go and understand, to look, and when you measure, you improve. So what we saw was quickly when we brought the infrastructure together on GCP and we were using, for example, ingestion with, we started with Aluma and then it went to Airflow and we went to um, Dataflow. We started seeing how we could actually stream this information. So from going from trying to go ahead and talk about the integrity of our information, we were able to go ahead and get this information near real time. And more importantly, we started seeing improvements. As an example, NPS, we grew um, 10x of where it was. Uh, we continue to see improvements. That fundamentally shaped our entire predictive analytics strategy to start looking at churn, not a re in a reactive state, but in a proactive state, by using, by incorporating all the data and having it in one place, we were able to accelerate our journey to using TensorFlow to start using decision trees, to start bringing the modern data together to start looking at customer experience and really translate that to operational um, sense. Whereas, whereas that we are looking at how we can actually go and drive um, improvements in churn by looking at 40 different variables. So let's talk a little bit about these business results. You started talking about the definitions and the centralization of 
of data and so forth. So did you go from a very decentralized way of looking at data to a centralized data warehouse that was getting feeds into in real time? And if that's the case, then how much time did that take you and what changes did you make? Did you have to hire new people? How'd that all work? Yeah, we did. I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges is we, we, we I think data was a liability for us at the beginning. So when I first came in, we were averaging about 80 defects in production a month, a month, which is unprecedented. But because we had no standards, there was no quality. Even though we had data warehouses, they were built on on-prem environments and they were fairly archaic. The code hadn't been updated in years. Um, the data model was fairly antique. So by bringing it all together, when I say all together, we effectively migrated a petabyte of information those 70 ODSs, the four data warehouses, the one data lake that we had on Hadoop. We structured the team. We all learned how to ramp up on GCP. We all learned how to use SQL and Python. And we effectively migrated everything within six months, which was, for me, was fairly impressive because that really started driving the business outcomes. And typically what you see in transformation, especially in data transformation programs or modernization efforts, if you're not quickly showing value, the energy starts fizzling out. So one of the biggest tenants was really planning effectively, getting everything migrated, getting everything migrated with quality to the point that every single dashboard that comes from us, every single data source has our seal of approval. Kind of like a, think of, think of this like an ISO seal. We're called GDO, so Global Data Office. And we have, every dashboard has our seal on it. If it doesn't have our seal, it's really not gonna be, I would say trusted, but it's not gonna be representative of what we have. Our seal, we use a traditional supply chain concept of a perfect order, and we converted that to data. If we have a definition for the metric, if it's defined, if it's secure, that's encrypted at rest and in transit, and that we check for completeness or accuracy, integrity of the information. If it has those three things, then it receives our seal, and that's what we expose. So there is no ambiguity of how you use that information. So there's a lot here. The do's and don'ts is the next section we're going to get to. Before we get to that, I want to talk about the concept of certification. If I want to certify data the way you are doing it, Juan, where mm -hmm. do I start? Do I hire new people to do it? Is this a automated through algorithms? How does this work? And it's not automated yet, but it is a manual process where we take a simple approach of making sure that we have the three tenets of quality, that we have security, and that we have a definition of governance around our metrics. It is manual right now. Whereas we don't have to invest in it. It's really the same team members, our BI team as an example, all the dashboards, they ensure that those three tenants are clearly defined, they're all aligned. And then once it's done, then we will put our seal on the dashboard as an example. Or when we pass data, our, our team will go and share that specific seal. It is manual right now, but we do want to get to the automation piece. And I firmly believe that that was the catalyst for us to go from less than 200 users of our information, our data, to over 2,000 concurrent users. So much so that I think that the average user um, of our, even our dashboards, before it was, they used to go and look at it in less than a minute, right now the average person looks at it for 26 minutes, meaning that they are going in and they're going deep in thought or going deeper. And now we're using those analytics to go ahead and help uh, improve that experience, improve more insights uh, to the organization. So you've got a full cycle here. Not only are you increasing the number of people adopting, but you're increasing the attention and all that is based on the seal of trust in the way that your team is applying to this data based on key principles. Let's talk about some other do's before we get to the don'ts. What is the one thing that people listening to us here that are trying to follow you uh, in, in a similar journey, an exceptional journey, what should they absolutely do? I highly encourage you all to really look into planning. We created something fairly unique in our organization, which is we created a product office. We start with three tenants, data as a service, data as a, as a platform, and data management as a service. So data management as a service, our governance, data as a platform, our infrastructure, data as a service is how we enable, how we consume our information, how we keep on driving the insights. So investing into an organization like that is going to play dividends because at the end of the day, you want to take out all the requirements, all the business partnership, all the technical specifications, so your team can really focus on what they can do right, is on really building the models, taking advantage of the next-gen analytics, really bringing together optimization strategies. And I think that is, that is absolutely pivotal. 
for a, what I was considered to do. That, and we incorporated also um, scaled agile. So being able to go in and have a defined methodology and then coupling that with the planning, I think that for me was a recipe for success. So both process and planning and doing that early as, as, as you move to your transformation journey. Now, what about the opposite of that? What is the mistake that most people do or do you see or maybe that you've done yourself that you want to make sure yeah. here is everyone's avoiding? I think the last thing is, I think everybody has great ideas. There's always going to be edge cases. Sometimes those edge cases, you may just want to go and live into the right, put them into a parking lot, because when you spend a significant amount of time to go and solve for that less than 1% of the issues, that's when it just drives frustration. It drives delays. And I would rather go in and focus on getting the bigger pieces right, start driving value, and then look upstream as to why those exceptions are happening. I think those are something that's something that I would recommend do not go do right now. Juan, thank you so much for your time today. We learned a lot. We learned about data certification and trust. We learned about the importance of planning and having a process to migrate to the cloud. And of course, we learned not to optimize for exceptions. This was an exceptional data journey. I hope people are going to reach out to you to learn more about your journey. Thank you again for spending the time with us today. If you want to find out more about stories just like this, make sure to click down uh, below here to the link of many more stories like this. Juan, I want to thank you for your time. I hope people are going to reach out to you and learn from you. Until next time, I'm Bruno Ziza.